Hello, 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 and welcome to Believe. That's B-L-E-A-V in Lions, right here on the Believe Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, at Javanaugh87, Jack Kavanaugh, and we have ourselves a very special episode, though I will apologize for the potential Green Bay bias that we're going to have, but it's going to be worth it because we are lucky enough to be joined by the 11-year veteran in the NFL for our NFC North rivals, the Panthers and the Seahawks, who also just put a beat down on the Lions, the skill (laughs) development professional or specialist, sorry, at process to perform second round pick out of Navy blocking for legends like Matt Hasselbeck, D'Angelo Williams, Jake DeLome and Brett Favre, as well as his co-host Amon Green. Welcome to the show. Pro Bowl left guard, Mike Wall. Jake, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate the time. Oh, so happy to have you. So, Mike, what are you doing now outside of football? I know you've got the stuff going on at Process to perform. Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been great. So, I really just work with athletes now, um, and and I have a a total athlete development platform, and that works with pros all the way down to preteens. We work in all different sports, confrontational sports, you know, in in particular things where it's it's going to be at some point in the game one v one, me versus you. But we really work on that tool set that it takes to become elite, takes to become the best version of yourself. And for me, the, those three themes are our mindset development, technical mastery, and ownership decisions, which are basically lifestyle, so lifestyle choices in the best interest of future you. And um, I, I put athletes through a platform that I really felt, really think helps them build that tool set, create those routines, and develop those habits that are going to give them not only success in sport, but how that's going to carry on to the rest of their lives. That's awesome to hear. Just the the complete package because a lot of people just want to focus on the on field or whatever on pitch, whatever your sport takes place on, but it's more than that. It's so much more than that. Yeah, really. It really is Jack. And and I was a skill development specialist after listen, I've, I failed. I got actually benched playing the Detroit lions. Tracy Stroggins had three sack fumbles on me um, in 2000 play. I was playing left tackle because I had no technique. And so, I had to become a technical master in order to be successful in this league. I appreciated. I came out of a, a, the Naval Academy, which while it was a fantastic school, it was an option school. I had no idea what I was doing, and I had to have that component. I was a hard worker, but didn't really know where. To, I didn't have the tool set, and so I had to struggle through that. I had to struggle through getting benched, have my name run through the mud, and everything. And when you find success and you want to hold on to that, you kind of figure out what the what the plan is, what the tool, what the process is to be successful. Um, I've been a tech, uh, skill development specialist in the NFL. Uh, I've worked with, and I still work with, professional athletes, really refining their technique, or they're on, improving that directly, improving that on-field performance. But what I've found is the lasting benefits of working not only the technical portion, but working above the shoulders, working on, on the, the cognitive and the emotional, I, I think that has um, a multiplier effect that we just really can't quantify yet. Um, it's the final frontier in sports, being able to deal with you know, how to, how to prepare for games, how to enter into practice in the right mindset to be successful, understanding your internal, external cues, all of the things that really we kind of, as professionals, work into our routine over the course of, of you know, decades. You know, the faster we can upload that information and work on it at an earlier age, the more successful we're going to be. This episode of the Believe in Lions podcast is brought to you by, by betonline.ag. Bet Online has you covered this holiday season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football continues its march through the College Bowl season and the NFL playoffs. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season, so head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit just use our promo code believe to receive your bonus that's b-l-e-a-v from basketball football nhl boxing and ufc right to your favorite vegas casino games do not wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season 
Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports. So don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing new offers available. Bet online where the game starts. And that's something that my co-host on Believe in Lions, Jerry Ball, talks about a lot where you come in and you just have the the athleticism, you're raw, you can just do it. But what separates you and lets you hang around in the league is that technique, is that preparation, is that acting like a professional in the NFL. Yeah, no question. You, you look at the NFL. I always tell athletes this. The, the bandwidth at the, at the highest level from from the, the best athlete to the average to, to, to the, the, the least athlete is very, very narrow. And so what really separates you is whether or not you can you can control your emotions on the field. You can process information in, in the best way possible. In other words, you can make decisions and, and execute on those decisions in the best way possible in the most efficient manner. That you have the technical ability to execute on those decisions. And then that you're making choices off the field or off the court in your in your social habits and in, in your eating, your lifestyle, your weightlifting, all the things you're doing to prepare, your film review. Do you watch? Do you know how to watch tape like a master poker player? Like, do you really know the in, the intricacies of, of your opponent and, and all that goes into you know? I, you know, I was looking at it this way: if you're not doing it, I'm going to do it. And when you meet me, you're going to have a real problem. And that's what I try to tell my athletes: if 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 you are wanting this kind of life, which is a fantastic life, and I'm not talking just being a professional athlete, but being six, just being successful. At something that you love to do is is the best way to go through life. I think if you want that and you really want to find success in a competitive environment, man, you got to be willing to put in the time, and you have to be willing to put in enough time to understand to get the most out of like the most efficient manner in which you can operate is the one you're going to find the most success in. Goosebumps already here talking to you and just listening to uh, all of that you have to offer and. With that technique, it comes in both the pass blocking and the run blocking. But I got to know, as a Navy guy, are you more of a fan of getting down and dirty in the run game or are you a pass protection guy? What's your... Oh, run game. Yeah. yeah I, 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 thought I, so. I can't imagine. Listen, I know you get paid for pass blocking nowadays, right? I, it, the pendulum's swinging back. You look at the NFL now. You know, the Philadelphia Eagles are running about 40 times a game. They're going into the playoffs, right? With a roster that nobody thought they'd go into the playoffs with. You look at the impact Derrick Henry's had in the NFL. You look at Jonathan Taylor and what he's done with the Colts this year. Oh, shoot, you look at the Green Bay Packers. They have two. I mean, they're cannibalizing their own stats. Either one of those guys would be a Pro Bowl player if they're just by themselves. I mean, we the, that league is going back that way. But for for you know five, seven years, it was a passing league, and you have all the, these offensive linemen look more like basketball players, and they're dropping back. They're not quite technically as sound, but they're just really good athletes. They're kind of getting in the way, and we're running these spread schemes. But I'm an old school guy, man. I like I like the I like the intimate physical contact that we got to have as offensive linemen running into defensive linemen and linebackers and safeties. I love that part of the game. That was the part of the game that I felt I could excel at. And so um, we pass pro because we have to. We run blocks as we get to. <laughs> I absolutely love that mentality, and I do agree with the the new trend in the NFL. And what really got me thinking about it is. The Patriots had all this money for the first time in Belichick's career, and he spent it on big offensive linemen, tight ends, and to build a run dominant to take on these now 210-pound linebackers. It's not Ray Lewis at 250 anymore, right? Yeah, and you're you're absolutely right. And again, the trend went that way. I mean, we had we had Nick Nick Barnett. Nick Barnett was a great player in this league, but we drafted him out of Oregon State. He's an A.B. Miller guy out of Fontana High School, just right down the street from where I grew up, right? So I'm I'm I love Nick. When Nick showed up, we walked into Sherman's office and was like, you gotta be joking, because he was like 225, 230, 230 pounds. And we said, There is no way on God's green earth you, this guy's gonna hold up in the middle. Because back in the day, we had Nardo Harris, who was 250 pounds. Jeremiah Trotter's running around the league, right? We have, these, <laughs> we have these units that are that are ready to go. But the the league changed. Thomas Davis came in, and I remember when I was in Carolina, and you know, even um, even he had a, a phenomenal athlete. He's only running around about 230, 235. But you could play the sport at that at, at that level and play at a high level because of the what we call now a tight end is not really a tight end. It's just a big wide receiver. Right. But yeah. because they started spreading those guys out and you have that option, we need some better athletes, but 
really good coaches are understanding now, especially where the powerhouse football teams are in the NFL. You talk about you talk about the Packers, you talk about the Patriots, you talk about the Kansas City Chiefs, cold weather teams, outdoor teams. You have to have a running game that travels if you want to play in the playoffs and, have, and make it in the playoffs. It's just a fact of life. And so you're going to see that trend, I think, continue for at least a couple of years before, you know, the NFL, Roger Goodell, you know, make some more ridiculous uh, rule changes in favor of the offense so we can spread the, the ball out even more. The, the, you know it's coming at some point because defenses are starting to adapt. It's starting to work. You're not seeing the the 40 to 45 shootouts from the Rams in Kansas City anymore, but it will swing in the other direction eventually. But good coaches and good players can adapt. Like Matt LaFleur, what do Packers fans and former players think about LaFleur? Do they give him all the credit he deserves or is there some reservation because he's working with Aaron Rodgers? I think probably both. Uh, it, you know, if you're asking me, you see the best coach in the NFL, it's it's hard to say that at this stage. Um, certainly with, I mean, well, first of all, it's Belichick, but even you start to think about Andy Reid and all that, Harbaugh is one of the most, I don't know why Harbaugh doesn't get every annually, every year, he's in top three for coach of the year. He To me, the job he's done this year, even with the team that they're dealing with now, you think about all the injuries. So there's some really good coaches in the league. I think, and I'm, I'm not there every week, but as a former player and kind of seen how Aaron Rodgers has not won a Super Bowl in like a decade, as, and then you see, you know, this of, of all the years, you see how supremely talented he is and how much better he is than everybody else in the league. Yeah. I think we appreciate that Matt LaFleur has come in and I don't want to say he revitalized his career, but but – Whatever was happening with the McCarthy, Aaron Rodgers relationship, whatever was happening with the play calling and kind of the staleness of not only the offense, but just how the team kind of felt year in and year out. I think having a fresh set of eyes in there, somebody that's willing to not only have a a new idea, a new way to run a system, but I think when you watch them, he has really allowed Aaron to flourish despite not having their healthy offensive line, despite playing against the, you know, out of a lot of really, really good opponents, both indoors and in cold weather, being able to get rid of the ball, surrounding him with, with a system where the athlete, even though MVS, Marvin Valdez-Cantin, isn't a household name, Lazard's not a household name, those guys are killing it. They're absolutely mm-hmm. killing it. And part of it's Aaron Rodgers. Part of those guys are holding themselves to a high expectation. You know, Adam Stenovich, uh, I, I'm rambling a little bit, but Adam Stenovich, the line coach for the Green Bay Packers, should be up for assistant coach of the year the way he, with, the, with the job he's done with the offensive line. And I think what happens is when you bring in a new staff, and LaFleur is a, is a, is a great head coach. I'm not ready to anoint him the, the best coach in the league, but he's a great head coach. When you bring in a new staff, you bring in an energetic staff, and you have a guy like Aaron Rodgers that has something to prove, I think what what you see is everybody in the building raises their game because they're so excited about the opportunity. And, and, and that's what I think of anything. He's really brought that to the Green Bay Packers. And it's it's just been, I mean, three 13 win seasons in a row. I mean, this is fantastic. It, it's truly ridiculous. I, it literally never been repeated in NFL history. We've never seen this kind of success right away. And, Looks like Aaron Rodgers is heading to -to back-to-back MVPs as well. So you never played with Aaron Rodgers, but you did play with an MVP in Brett Favre. What does that award bring to a locker room? Having that kind of elite talent in the locker room to build around. Yeah, I don't know if the award matters that much to the locker room, but having that level of talent... Mm-hmm. It does two things. Um, one, it forces you to raise the standard of whatever you think your standard was. I think it forces you to raise your standard or at least go about your business in a slightly different way. Like I'll, I'll give you an example. The, the, the best thing that Brett ever told taught me, and he didn't teach me directly, but just being around him, being around Reggie White, Leroy Butler, all those guys, was that when you're younger and you're playing high school football, especially back in the, you know, the 90s, 2000s, you're playing college football, you feel like you have to manufacture a lot of emotion. You feel like you have to you know, you know, sniff ammonia, listen to loud music, bang your head against the wall, slap each other in the face. You have to manufacture this emotion to go out there and perform. 
And what those guys and what ben, Brett Matila was kind of the pie piper of this was that, you know, we prepare, we work hard, we kick ass, we have fun doing both of them. And, and you don't need to manufacture emotion. If you're good, you can just be good. And you can enjoy going out there and being good and, and beating everybody up and having a good time playing with your teammates that you work hard with. And that was a real revelation to a guy like me because I was I thought that we needed to kind of get amped up in order to play. The other thing that they do is there's a – you never think you're out of a game. It doesn't matter, you know. I remember we were down in – we were in St. Louis, and I think he threw six picks for like four touchdowns, that four interceptions for returns for touchdowns that, that game. We still thought we were in the game to the last – you know, the last half of the quarter because we you, you have the best player in the league. It's like we always have a shot. You always got to – you guys got the gunslinger's opportunity. So, you know, I, raising the bar – for the rest of the team, having the expectations set that much higher and knowing that you have to stay a couple minutes late to watch more film, you know, you the last thing you want to do, especially as an offensive lineman, is is let down the city of Green Bay by getting your quarterback hurt. Yeah, and especially when he's as successful, as dominant as Brett Favre, now Aaron Rodgers, just Green Bay has truly been blessed for quite a while. You're almost, as a Lions commentator and fan, you almost get a little bit bitter and a little bit jealous. You're just being a little bit too spoiled for our, our pre preference. But when it comes to the Detroit lions, what do Packers players think when they've got the lions on the schedule? Well, listen, Dan Campbell, I know Dan, um, you know, we were, we were in the league at the same time. Uh, we coached at the same time in Miami for a year. And Dan is a guy that is going to get, his players to, to, to love him and they're going to play hard. Uh, when he was the interim coach in Miami, <clears throat> the players wanted him to be the head coach. They absolutely loved him. Now, were we, you know, there's a point where the emotion kind of wears off and you got to learn how to play ball and, and you know, be technical masters and, and, and understand how the, the film sessions and, and kind of get your really high sporting intelligence and football IQ that part of it, I think, is something I'm sure he's learned from, from being with Sean Payton and whatnot. But they're going to play hard, and it's not an easy out. And, and I don't think that your team has a, a, a great amount of talent at this stage by any means. But I think every time you go into a game, especially up at Ford Field, it's a tough win. It's always a tough win, and they, and they play them well. And, and you know when you're, when you're a Green Bay Packer, it's like, you know, it, it's the same thing as if you're an LA Laker, if you're a, you know, you play for the Alabama Crimson Tide. Like you got every game, you're gonna get the teams, you're gonna get somebody else's best game because you're usually the best in the league. And so, I guess for the Lions, for the Bears, for the Vikings, it's all they think they're the Packers' biggest rival because <laughs> the Packers <laughs> yeah, are that's right. consistently the best. But for the Packers, is it the same across the board? It's this is a division game. We're taking it just as serious, no matter who it is. Well, cer certainly in, re in recent years, right? Because there hasn't really been somebody to challenge. I think for the for the title in recent years, Minnesota being the closest. You know, when I was there, I got drafted, and Randy Moss got drafted that year. So all of a sudden, the Vikings were really, really good. And then we, the next draft, we drafted a, a, a guy out of Clemson, Antoine Edwards. He, he turned out to be a bust, but we got Fred Vinson who we traded, who was another DB. So the first guy, DB, second guy, DB, we traded for Amon. And then third guy, Chi-Town, Mike McKenzie, who ended up, you know, starting in Green Bay for seven, seven, eight years. It was a great player, but we drafted all those guys just, just because of Randy Moss. Right. And yeah. then I remember Levy Smith came to town and he was like, all we care about is beating the Packers. And then the first team they, they came up and they beat us. So though, and then, you know, they got Brian, they got Lance Briggs, uh, they, they drafted Tommy Harris, who was an incredible player. So all of a sudden you started having those old John Randall rivalries, Luther Ellis rivalries. Um, you, 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 had, you, had, you had the multiple guys on the Bears that, that were good players, and it was always kind of a, a good game. Um, that was, you know, later, late 90s, early 2000s. But I think recently when you kind of look at this rivalry thing, you know, the Packers are trying to win Super Bowls right now, NFC championships and Super Bowls. And, and I don't mean that – that sounds smug – but it really is with when you have Aaron Rodgers, that it's got to be Super Bowl or bust. Otherwise, it's it's kind of a, a an off season. Yeah, it might sound smug to outside <clears throat> fans, but 
it's reality as a Lions fan, as a Bears fan, even a Vikings fan. You can't be upset because you haven't given anything to combat that. But back to John Randall for a second, because my co-host Jerry Ball, great friends with John Randall. Oh. What was it like playing against those two on that 98 and 99 Vikings team? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Just terrible. So, so you know, listen – Jerry, Jerry's a you know, very, very good player, right? But John Randall was the best defensive tackle in the league. Yeah. And he knew it, and he was going to let you know it. And I remember <laughs> my first game, I was playing left guard. So I think the first the, the first game I played in the NFL, like left guard, the, or the first game of the season was Daryl Russell in Oakland, right? The, 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 Raiders, the Raiders. Yeah. He was coming off an all-pro year, so he, and he was, you know, he, he was a pretty good player, but I think the second game was Randall. And I'm, I remember somebody saying that he does research on these guys and it was, it was a, the first third down. It was like third and eight. And my nickname in college was Beagle after this guy, Ronnie Beagle was an all American in Navy. And uh, that must've made the, it must've made the, uh, the media guide because third and eight we're here in the play. And I just hear Beagle. <laughs> And I turn around, he's like, he's just staring at me. And I'm like, ah, I'll be there in a minute. And I turn around, I'm like, oh, shit. You know, like, <laughs> here we go. But that that guy was absolutely, he was like a bowling ball with knives, man. I mean, just he, incredible leverage. He would beat you, spin out of beating you, and then beat you again. and could still get to the quarterback. Like, he was that good. I haven't seen anybody like him until Aaron Donald showed up. Yeah, that's kind of what Jerry and I have talked about is just, Aaron Donald is just class of his own. John Randall, yep. class of his own. They do it a little bit differently, though. Aaron Donald, he he's fiery, but he doesn't have the... He's not looking up who your girlfriend or your mom's name is and, and using that to psych you out during a game like John Randall. Yeah, he's got that, like, but he's got that boardroom neck that kind of just goes straight down to his shoulders, right? So he's got that... He's walking around that boardroom neck, so he, the intimidation is there. He doesn't have to say a word. Oh, John was yeah. a great time. And you got to remember the ch the times are different. Like John's like sack celebrations were, I mean, even we didn't, of course we're, we don't like to see him, but yeah, he, he was a character and, and uh, Aaron Donald's for my money, Aaron Donald's the best defensive tackle I think I've ever seen. Uh, he, he's that good to me. I mean, when I think about guys that I just go, I don't even know how you would, block, when he's angry, I don't even know how you'd block him consistently. I just, he just he's so so good. John was that way too, I guess. But I caught John at the beginning of my career, so he, it's he's like he's at his prime, and I'm just starting out. So the perspective's probably a little bit off. Although he was, you know, he was so good that I think they famously said in Green Bay, "Hey, we're, when we go to Minnesota, we throw hot off the three technique." Like he was that good. But Aaron 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 Donald's amazing. Yeah, yeah, he he really is. But there's no lack of stars on this Packers roster either, especially yeah. with this playoff push. You might be. I, I got to know. Will we see Jair Alexander or David Bakhtiari play this offseason or this postseason? I, I certainly hope so. And all indications uh, sound like they, they did pretty well uh, in practice yesterday in individuals. Uh. So. Listen, if it's one of those scenarios, and this is for me, this is why like the Lions game is actually super critical because I would much rather get them in for half a game. Like if you can get a D -Bock in for a half a game, yeah, and then now you get your week of rest and, and you you're prepped up, you're ready to go for the playoffs. I feel good about him because he's in my in my opinion, he's the best left tackle in the league when he's healthy. So I feel good about him. Regardless if he if he comes off cold or he gets a, a, a you know half a game in, but I think for continuity of the line, it's probably a good thing. Same, Alexander's a great player; he's going to be okay either way. But you'd like to see him live bullets. Josh Myers, the same thing. If you can get him in, we've uh, uh, Z Smith. You can get him; he's a veteran, so he's going to be okay. But you just hope they can get that that time in playing against a team that you know is going to give you their best. So we're we're yeah. kind of hoping we see some of these players. Definitely, and just being able to knock off some of that rust, get back into that, that movement. Cause as you said, live bullets are completely different than anything you're doing in practice. And as much in as much one-on-one -on -one work that you can do at uh, process to perform, you still can never truly replicate live reps. No, and I'll tell you what we, we have this, uh, I call it a progression sack and it's the best way to, turn a movement pattern 
into a skill that you, you know, and you go through the movement pattern, you go into a technical progression, you understand that you have to add decisions to that in order to kind of supercharge your development. And then at some point you do have to go find out how good it is live. So you can take assessment and, and, and make some tweaks. Right. And it's all part of the process, but you, you know, a lot of people, it's like, um, it's like Devontae Adams said this week when when DBs ask him, you know, what, should I, what, what drill should I start? And he's like, no, just go run routes because when you run routes full speed, you learn a lot about how to come in and out of breaks, where your body, what, how your your body follows your head, where you need to whip around first when you when you make these three point turns, like all of these things you can't find out if you're going half speed. And that's just something that the best of the best can teach you, like a Devontae Adams, like the Packers offensive line coach who you mentioned phenomenal job this year they lost really elton has. jenkins at i think elton jenkins could be an all pro at all five offensive line positions he's a star you lose him you lose josh myers you lose billy turner for a while as well so now the you look at the line josh nyman john runyon lucas patrick the rookie royce newman and dennis kelly and none of them are household names but they're still performing at such a high level yeah, wow. it, it's yeah, well, there's there's a couple of things. One, the quarterback makes a big difference. They've schemed the, the the way that so really good teams, and this doesn't happen in every in every club. Really good teams, really good offensive line coaches build a concept from one singular concept into a multitude of plays, play fakes, play action passes, drop back passes, bootleg passes, different sorts of runs. And so your offensive line can continue to do the same kind of technique or movement pattern with all these different um, these different plays that are in the playbook. And it allows the center and the left guard, for example, to continue to work on their double team block, regardless if it's a downhill play, whether it's a keep pass, whether it's a play action pass, whether it's a bootleg pass, whether it's a dive instead of an outside. Like they can just keep working their stuff. And when you're able to do that, not only are you making it difficult to pressure, you know, pressuring the defense because their eyes don't know where to go, right? Their eye discipline lacks, but you're also just getting free reps for your offensive line. And not every, a lot of teams just kind of start throwing, you know, the you watch the Bears sometimes. It looks like they're just throwing a dart up on the board, like, hey, what do you want to, what do you want to run this time? There's no continuity to it. But a good team, and the, one thing about Lafleur's offense is. They might do a lot of window dressing with all the all the the shifting, but when you watch the offensive line, they're good because they've gotten really good at double teams, and and they and they do a good job of identifying the pressure problem in the in the in the offensive line from a pass protection standpoint and trying to get another body on them. And they, I mean, they're not great at at single blocks. They're not particularly good at you know outside zone or coming downhill, but they can double team. And they can pass off games, and that's the sign of a good, a well coached offensive line. And especially doing it with multiple iterations of that offensive line, people in and out of the lineup. So I am really excited to see them against the Lions, but I'm also excited to see the offensive line of the Lions against the Packers defense. I don't know okay. if you've watched them much this season. We're missing Frank Rag now, the All Pro center, but the Frank's book great. and tackles of. Taylor Decker and Panay Sewell, the youngest player in the league too. That gets me excited. Let me ask you. So they're both good players, obviously. How, what was the sentiment? In, in, so I thought that I thought that the, the kid from uh, Northwestern that went to the chargers for me, when I, when I kind of looked at those guys, I thought he, cause he's out of the box. You know, he's all pro caliber to me out of the box. I think Panay Sewell's a, a very, very athletic, probably has the right mindset, probably has the right demeanor. The game he played against the Rams that I watched was the best game I think he played of the season. Mm -hmm. But he was a little bit behind as far as football IQ, as far as technical mastery. But he has a little work to do. Young, like you said, he's young. He's got a lot, but he's and he's got a, a long career, a very fruitful career ahead of him. Um, but I think against. It'll be interesting to see because the way that Preston Smith's been playing the run and the pass, but really the run, uh, Rashawn Gary is you know tied for third in the league with pressures. Um, he's he's becoming a player that you're going to have to game plan against, um, I think, in the future, and and that's going to really bode well, especially when you bring back Z Smith and you're able to 
combine those three guys, maybe in a nickel package with Kenny Clark, who is probably the best run, the best like two way player, not named Aaron Donald in the interior, off, you know, defensive line in football right now. Doesn't have a ton of pass rush moves, but can get an edge, can pressure, has the numbers this year in the passing game, but is is an absolute wild man in the running game. I mean, just yep. dominates people. Like he got Aaron Donald treatment all last week, getting double teamed on almost every right, play. Rightfully so. Just absolutely dominates people, right? So, and Dean Lowry's been playing well. I mean, it's it. They're a fun group to watch. And then they brought in Devonte Campbell, and I tell you, Devonte Campbell was in Atlanta, and I, you know, he was he was a good player. Um, but he was nothing like he is now. Mm-hmm. He is he is an absolute difference maker at the linebacker position. We were very, very lucky to have him. And that's honestly why I'm excited to see Sewell, because like you said, he isn't as technically sound as Slater was coming out, but it's the raw athleticism that you can mold, you can shape. And so in the preseason, Lions fans got really upset because when they were facing the Steelers, he got whipped a couple times by Melvin Ingram. Me though, yeah, Melvin's a great, yeah. You know, Mel, everybody, Melvin Ingram is an unbelievable player, though, right? I would rather Sewell lose those reps in preseason, and you could see throughout the game, he beat him with one move, he wouldn't beat him with that move again, he beat him with another move, he wasn't getting beat on the same pass rush move twice. That's all I can ask for. So, to see Sewell against premier pass rushers like Gary and the Smith bros and against the run and Kenny Clark. That's what I want. I want our best, our franchise right tackle now to face those types of matchups because you're not getting better by facing subpar competition. If the Packers had rested their starters this week, I'd be disappointed too. I want the Packers best. Yeah, at this stage in the game, and I think DC would probably tell you the same thing. You know, they're really about evaluating and, and developing talent, and they're probably going to be that way for probably next year as well, to some extent, right? Until they figure oh, yeah. out if you have the right quarterback and the right pieces in place to be successful. But um, when you have a young offensive line, a uh, young offensive lineman, and and luckily having Frank in the middle because that guy, I know he's a young player still, but. He plays like a veteran. Um, yeah. His intelligence, his his sporting intelligence is super, super high. His demeanor is great. So I'm sure he's also uh, ha- has some mentorship capacity within him as well. But when you have these young guys, you want to put them in situations where they're uncomfortable as often as you can. Because you, 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 you know, with the human growth is just outside the comfort zone, right? So you want to be able to stretch these guys as often as you can. And then you have that tape. And, and look, for, you know, for, for young players who are listening to this, the only thing that comes close to to live action is being able to watch yourself and grade yourself and prove yourself watching film. And so getting that tape against good competition and seeing how your initial footwork changed because you were worried he was going to beat you on the edge, seeing how you held your, your inside arm too low because you were worried he was, you were waiting on that stab, you wanted to wipe it off, like seeing how inconsistent you are in your set so you can go ahead and go and prove that that's what's going to make him, you know, eons better next year as he goes in. And, and they have <clears throat> they're talking about is Hank Fraley still your coach over there, right? Yes, he is. Hank Fraley, well, he was a great player, but he's 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 done a phenomenal job. Last year he was a he was a stay on with Dan, right? Because he was there two years ago. Yeah, and I remember watching watching your your O line two years ago or the year before this, and thinking, man, their offensive line. I don't know what anybody's complaining about. They do not have a problem. They are a very, very well-coached team. Again, double teams and passing off games. If, if you as a fan or somebody who's trying to evaluate talent, if you want to see what if, if an offensive line is well-coached or not, look at their double teams and look if they can pass off games. It's really that simple. Yeah, and with Fraley, what actually happened was after Matt Patricia was let go or beforehand, Taylor Decker and Frank Ragnow went to management and said, you cannot let this man out of the building. He is far too talented. And one thing that the lions under Dan Campbell have really done is all, a lot of the coaches are former players able to relate better to the player and teaching technique because they can say, I've been there. I've done that from your experience. Does that work? Well, I think a lot of a lot of guys like me are rooting for them because we've always hoped that we had 
a former player in the room because oftentimes you get in a situation that while a non a person who has not played the position could be extremely intelligent and have watched thousands of hours of tape especially when at a position like mine the intimacy of of confrontation is something that if you don't experience it it's very tough to describe and so there's situations that we often get to as offensive linemen when you get a game plan on Wednesday you look at the game plan and you'll say there's absolutely no way I can make this play. I just can't do it. It's with that, it's it's outside of my capacity. And and an offensive coordinator, an offensive line coach, a quarterback's coach, whoever it is that doesn't understand what you're saying will say too bad, we just do the best you can and then they'll run it 10 times in the game. You'll get 10 minuses on your chart and you're like, "Well, I told you I couldn't do it." Not nah, they just don't get it. And so having that understanding and having that trust in the communication, that relationship with a guy who's been through it before, as long as they are schematically sound, as long as it, there, there is a, a, a divide, there's a, there's a coaching personality and there's a player personality. You know, I think it has a, it has a, the opportunity to be extremely successful. And that's really what I'm seeing under these lions is it's paying off slowly, but surely they're competitive. There's been growth throughout the season and it makes me excited that maybe someday in the near ish future, we'll be competing with your green Bay Packers, but that for what to- you mean like game to game. Cause you guys aren't winning a championship <laughs> in the next five years, man. There's just no way. I'm, I, listen, game, I'm sorry. I'm not talking game. trash. It's just, there's no way I, I, I bet my house on it. I, yeah, I, I just don't. Yeah. I just don't see it. Yeah, we're 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 taking small victories. We're talking about competing <laughs> game to game. We're talking about you know maybe eking out an NFC North if Aaron Rodgers leaves and you're operating yeah. with Jordan Love because that is the only way in the next five years I see it happening. Are, are you guys keeping? Are you guys keeping Jared? Cause is Jared Goff? I mean, he we all really he's not the answer, right? So uh, no. are are you keeping him or or so what's what's happening there? What's going to happen there is because of the the trade for Stafford with the contract, he will be in Detroit next year. What should and hopefully will happen is they draft someone to learn under him or compete with him, eventually Mm -hmm. take over. And then in 2023, Jared Goff will be cut or traded is the hope slash what we think the, the writing on the wall says that we're not going to have our franchise quarterback starting until 2023 at earliest. Yeah, I just look at it like I think Garoppolo is going to be in San Francisco. He probably stays there. Um, I, I would take Taylor Heineke. I mean, I, I know that sounds stupid, but I would take Taylor Heineke because at least it with – see, the problem with a guy like Jared Goff is he was the second pick in the draft. So you're he's always going to – fool you he's gonna have this game where you're like man he can do it like sean mcveigh did the same thing right he 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 has the physical tools that can wow you and what happens is you know they call those guys um they call those guys three staff guys right because they get three coaching staffs fired <laughs> you know, i mean it, it's not a knock on him it yeah, was just no. he's a super talented guy but if it's not processing and it's not going to happen, he's got enough talent where you're like, dude, he, he's the guy and you'll just keep hanging on as opposed to bringing in a guy like Heineke where you're like, oh, we know he's probably not the guy, but he can win us nine games. You see, there's there's just it, it's, it's a really tough thing to keep a guy in the building like that because he has enough physical talent where he'll cheat you. And then I think Mark Brunel is your quarterback coach. Yeah. And you know, I mean, you got, you know, Mark's going like, I can fix him. I'm, you know, he's, he's Mark Brunel for God's sakes. Like, how could he not? You know what I mean? So it's just, it's really, really hard unless he makes this monumental jump or you've seen something now that you're like, he's processing at a level he wasn't processing that before. It's dangerous to keep him in the, in the, in the building next year, even though I don't know if, you know, financially there's a way out of it. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree, and I think because of the contract, he will have to be back. But he's the perfect quarterback for when everything's perfect. When they all, there's no pressure, when the receivers are open, he's great. 
It's when anything breaks down around Jared Goff, that's when the happy feet start. He panics under pressure. And that's why I really hope that with the Lions' second first round pick, they take a quarterback. So it's, hey, Jared, you're you're the starter this year, but this is the Patrick Mahomes plan. We're we're moving on from you next year. And I hope they I don't tell spend that. a lot of I don't spend a lot of time looking at 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 the uh, at the NFL draft, but from what I can gather, uh, aside from maybe that picket kid, there's not a lot of first rounders out there. No, it's a it's more of a what what it's more of a late first round draft, like a Jordan Love, where there's these guys with the, with tools, not all put together, and so, so th- this that's is why the I, reason. This is the reason, Jack, that that you guys should go the Philadelphia Eagles route. Go, you already, you've already invested a huge amount of capital in your offensive line. Yeah. Go get a Mercedes Lewis type tight end that can just, or Gronk, pick, fill the gap of or a guy who can just block his absolute, you know, he blocks his backside off. Yes. And then go find two 1A running backs and you have yourself an offense. And you, and you Carson Wentz, the kid. You know what I mean? Don't give him yeah. a chance to drop back and make – dude, Carson Wentz the kid, Jalen Hurts the kid, whatever you want to call it, but make the running game the staple of your offense. And now – because that's really – you think about it honestly. What's the only way to beat Aaron Rodgers? You're not going to beat him in a shootout. You beat him by keeping you, him off the field. You beat him by not having – yeah, not giving him the ball. You give him the ball, you're done. I mean, the percentages are just too far in his favor. So – being able to hold that ball, being able to control the clock, being able to control the tempo of the game is something that they you just kind of look at their offensive line, you look at their line coach, he's like, you're not that far away from being able to do that if you'll just buy in. And that's the I think that's the hard part in the, today's NFL with these scheme masters sometimes is just buying in. I know Anthony Lynn was there, and I think Dan's calling the plays now. So yeah, who knows what will happen. Yeah, I and I – do think Dan wants to buy in and that's what happened with Anthony Lynn. They weren't too, uh, downhill enough. They weren't running it enough. Dan Campbell takes over and they see a big jump in running rushing attempts. Even when Deandre Swift is hurt, go to mm-hmm. Jamal Williams, who I know you had him in green Bay. He's been a light to this locker room, the yeah. kind of culture setter that the lions need. They need that attitude, the fun and relaxed, but also the, business we're going to grind it out i'm gonna run you over for four yards of carry there's a handful of guys in the league right now that you could go pick up as a complimentary back that are more than capable of being thousand yard rushers 1200 yard rushers for for the detroit lions and uh i you know i just we're i, I bring it up because i get excited about the idea of more teams going back to like running the football and yeah. having that being the point of emphasis and not doing it as on a casual basis, but really investing in this is our offense. We're going to be this kind of team. We're going to run the ball and stop the run because we know it travels and, and start looking over the horizon as the, the powerhouses in the NFL right now play outside in the winter. And we, if we want to compete, that's what we have to, we have to be able to do. The motor city toughness that Dan Campbell's trying to instill. I think, I hope that we're headed in that direction because I can't do the Matt Patricia style anymore. That was just, painful three years of pure pain you know I, I remember when i was when i got drafted because I, I i wasn't an nfl fan until i got drafted and so i didn't really follow okay. the detroit lions but i was kind of the it was the matt millen era and <laughs> i just and i just in you had good players robert porsche luther Rellis, you, you big you drag guys drafted big sean from texas um you had obviously barry sanders was there the best player i've ever seen play football um, but Calvin Johnson, I, we, we can go on, but the point is you just start going, well, at what point is we stop looking at the Matt Millen being hired, uh, Matt Patricia, you know, all these names that continually are, you know, abysmal in Detroit at some point it's gotta be, maybe the owner should think about relinquishing some decision-making responsibility to somebody else. I mean, it, it just, it's just absurd. It, it really has been. And so two years ago, we ended up getting, or well, sorry, last summer before this, Sheila Ford Hamp took over from her mother, Martha Ford. And that feel, they brought Chris Spielman back into the front office. They have Brad Holmes at the GM. It really 
feels different this time. I and Chris I know Speedman was an absolute unit when he was playing. I, lo- I love the way he played football. I bet she's doing a great job up there. We we're really happy to have him, and we yeah. really think that has us. That whole culture shift has us finally. And I know people say it all the time. This is the year things get right, but I truly believe we're. This isn't the year things get right. But this is the year things start heading in the right direction. We can hope. Well, it but, starts with paying that guy with the jersey you got on the wall behind you his money or something. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's get that right. Let's get that right first. Huh? <laughs> we, Jerry and I have been pushing for that. And we're hoping this offseason that uh, Sheila, sit, the owner, sits down with Calvin one on one, writes a check there on the table, Seriously. hands it over, and then they can have that conversation. Because I know that I know that the Detroit has got a fantastic community, and I know they don't particularly care historically about what the rest of the, the country thinks, but I can tell you that that has not reflected well in the rest of the NFL circles. Yeah, it, it really doesn't seem to, especially <laughs> when a couple of years later Andrew Luck gets 12 million and Calvin Johnson has to pay back 1.6. Right. <laughs> it's, it, it's the way some teams treat their players, it, it's funny, and that. Before we get you out of here, I got to know, do you think Aaron Rodgers, things can reconcile and he'll be back? Or is this the last dance? You know, it's it's such an interesting question, I think, given what's happened, what, how, how this year's transpired, how much success they've had. Um, he's going to win a second MVP in a row. They seem to have the pieces in place to have a championship team. And... If Aaron feels like he has to go prove it, I mean, why would Aaron Rodgers feel like he has to go prove it somewhere else? And people keep saying, well, everyone sees Tom Brady and Russell Wilson sees Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers sees Tom Brady. Russell Wilson and Aaron Rodgers were not playing under Bill Belichick. And Bill Belichick is like a hero of mine. But I think his locker room, the way he does business, is a little bit different than how Aaron Rodgers is being treated with Matt LaFleur. No offense. Just a touch. and, and how Pete Carroll treats Russell Wilson. Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't seem like – when I close my eyes and go, if I was Aaron Rodgers, where else would I go that's going to give me a legitimate chance to win two more Super Bowls in the next four years? It's not, it doesn't feel like Pittsburgh's that to me. It doesn't feel like Denver's that to me. It feels like Green Bay's the spot that I would stay if I wanted to play four more years and win two more Super Bowls because guess what? Their offensive line's young, and their secondary is young, and it's only going to get better. And it's arguably the weakest spot on their on their team right now, aside from their terrible special teams. It's arguably the weakest spot on their team, and it's only but it also has the biggest room for improvement because they're all young players. So I would be, and he's he is an absolute. They would name every single street in town, every drink they serve at the bar, the bar itself. They would name everything after that guy. I mean, he is an he's he's a he's a god up there. I I don't know why you would leave, and especially when we've heard his thoughts on Devonte Adams, the best player he's ever played with. He loves the man. They can easily stay together in Green Bay if things can be resolved. And I think at this point, we saw the one game of Jordan Love. I think the Packers will be smart enough to say, you know what, come home, Aaron, stay home be with us. And I think you know, if they win a Super Bowl, it's it's guaranteed. Well, you know, it's like it's like the AB thing today. And and AB's got he's had, you know, he's had instances already and he has a, he has a history. But there is also a history in the NFL of 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 teams wanting players to play injured because it because the coaches don't want to lose their jobs. And when this is all said and done, the most important person in the city of Green Bay and the Packers organization is number 12. There's no, and there's really no 1A, it's him. And as he goes, the Green Bay Packers will still exist when he leaves, but they are not going to be the same team. And it is very unlikely that the trajectory of the coaching staff, the personnel staff, everybody in that building it's unlikely that their trajectory is going to be along the same path it is now. So it is in their best interest to do anything they can. And they, those guys, Goody's a smart guy. LaFleur is a smart guy. It is in their best interest to make sure that man is in the is in that 
locker room until the day he retires. It makes no sense to do anything else. You have to do that when you have an all-time great. You have to make sure that they retire. <laughs> Michael Michael Irvin with the Cowboys. You make sure they never, ever leave. And so I think Aaron Rodgers stays. I think that they make the Super Bowl, and I don't think there's an AFC team that can compete with them. But what about this Sunday? Because our friends over at betonline.ag have Green Bay as only four-point favorites against the Lions. Are they expecting a uh, a half game? I would imagine so, right? It, it, and and uh, they're probably right. I would imagine they, they, they play half. I think Aaron and Devontae both come out and said they want to play. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, fun fun fact though, you know, when whenever the spread gets around three points, that's the the odds makers are wanting you to bet the other way. So, you know, they're trying to they might be trying to fill their book too. We don't know. They yeah they the Vegas has been hurt a couple times lately, so they may be using this one to draw us in just a little bit. What's your score prediction for Sunday though? Oh, I think it'll be a good game. Um, gosh, maybe something like twenty twenty seven Packers. That I, I can dig it. I can absolutely dig it. I was going to go 23-27, so right in the same ballpark. I have them pushing the four-point spread. Nobody wins except for Vegas because that always seems to happen. But, Mike, thank you so much for joining the Believe in Lions podcast. Before we get you out, do you have any pluggables that you want to plug? Yeah, just, just uh, you know, if you want to follow me, we talk, we talk player development, Packers football, and any other nonsense that comes along along those two lines. So follow me at MikeWall68, a process to perform on Instagram. If you're a parent player or coach interested in the player development discussion, hit me up at process to perform.com or get on my Facebook page. We have a total athlete development platform or group that you can get involved with. And if you listen to this whole podcast, you're going to want to get involved with Mike because the knowledge he's been dropping, not only on field, but off field as well, is truly invaluable to young and old athletes, just anyone involved. So thank you very much for tuning in. And until next week, we will see you next time.